What's up everybody and welcome to Inside the Game, your source for everything in the world of video games. We've got another hot show where you can always be a part of it by going to insidethegame.ca or hitting us up in Discord where there you can submit your clip and be the highlight of the week. What do we have on this week's episode? Here it is. It's the rundown. The story is great. There is so much lore within this world. Like uh, Sir so. Plunk a lot. <laughs> he comes up, <laughs> yeah. he's in the clouds, you can move the clouds out of the way. Like everything in this game is interactive. Right? For yourself. Josh, why don't you give us a lowdown? How'd you make it here? <laughs> I ask myself that question every day. So <laughs> We're taking a look at Kirby and the Forgotten Land, and this is the latest release. Looks like a fantastic show, so let's get going as Nate kicks things off with a beautiful looking side scroller. Take it away, Nate. Looks like we gotta save our siblings from the Urlogs in this one. So in Greek Memories of Azur, it's a side-scrolling platformer where you get to play single player and control Greek, the main character who's set to rescue his brother and sister, Adara and Raydel. The Urlogs have come to the land of Azur and are wreaking havoc and destroying everything. The Kurians, your people, are trying to escape and build a massive airship. So this is where the story takes off. You are all alone and are separated from your siblings. You have to then rescue them. And once you do, you actually get to control them all single player. And this is where things can sometimes get dicey. You have the ability to toggle between characters, controlling them individually or controlling them as a clump. And they do have some sort of auto attack system where if they're in front of an enemy, they will attack them. But the intelligence of this system sometimes gets in the way. Often while you're platforming, you'll just clip an edge with one of your characters and then they'll get separated. And then this makes you switch your characters, then do the platforming section all over again. And it just makes this whole system sort of cumbersome. Yes, it can work great, but ultimately, once you got three characters, you're having to do the same part sometimes three times in a row. And I think that's what unfortunately takes you away from this otherwise incredible experience. The story is great. There is so much lore within this world that you can seek out. There is a lot of reading. Keep that in mind. It's kind of that old school bubble text where you're often reading paragraph after paragraph. But it's still that old aesthetic that might appeal to many. The graphics, I mean, are incredible. It has this Ori and the Blind Forest Will of the Wisps feel, where it's sort of layered. You've got this art style where you have a foreground and all these different layers on your screen, and it just gives so much life and color to this game that you don't see in many other titles. The game mostly consists of quests and side quests, these side quests upgrading your characters or just these main quests progressing the story where you and your brother and sister are here to build this ship and help the Kurians escape from the terror of the Urlogs. So I guess if there's one more thing I could complain about is maybe the inventory system. Both characters, all the characters, their inventory systems are all separate. So when you go to cook some items, because cooking is very important in this game, you have to basically make different healing products from the various ingredients that you pick up throughout the world. But it just makes it frustrating that you have to navigate between these three characters when you're either shopping or cooking. It just adds so much time, which makes it just that much more frustrating. Yes, I know you could put ingredients in the cooking pot and then switch characters and put other ingredients to add on top of it, but still this little system doesn't make up for the rest of it. So while you're out exploring the world and defeating enemies, there are boss encounters that are pretty fun and the combat is fairly intuitive at times, but you do get that sense of reward. 
Also what spikes up the difficulty is that there are only select checkpoints throughout the world. There are these save points, these stones throughout the world that you have to use to save your progress. So is the questing, the sense of adventure in Greek Memories of Azur worth it? Well I kinda think so. They get a lot of things right in this game. The audio is incredible. When it hits, it's unlike anything I've heard in many games. It really ramps up, but then out of nowhere after just a couple minutes, it just goes completely silent. All of this on top of gorgeous graphics, but the unfortunate, cumbersome act of having to control three characters at times really can just somewhat take you out of this experience. So I'm going to have to give this game though a 7. It still hits so many things right and I do recommend checking it out for its just over $20 price Canadian. This game hits so many things right, with a beautifully created world that has music to set the tone and pace of the game. But all of this can be kind of hindered by the fact that you're stuck controlling all three characters at times. Maybe if they made this a three player game, it could have been a much smoother, cleaner experience. Assassin's Creed has been around a very long time, which means we all have our favorite assassin. That's right, on this week's episode, the guys and I break it down. Who's our favorite? So make sure you stick around. Assassin's Creed is a series that's been around for quite some time now. It's put you in the shoes of a lot of really exemplary assassins, but I think my ultimate favorite has to be Adewale of Trinidad. Deprived of any right, of any faith. Adewale was born, unfortunately, into a slavery plantation, and he was only free when a pirate crew happened upon his settlement and burnt it to the ground. He was kind of reborn in a show of violence, and he becomes a pirate figure for most of his life. You first meet him in Black Flag when Edward Kenway brings him upon the Jackdaw to be his kind of second in command, and that's where he serves as a valiant soldier. Eventually, he appears in his own DLC to Black Flag, and that's called Freedom Cry. He finds another group of people that are awfully oppressed, enslaved, and, well, he puts up his hidden blade for more of a hands-on approach. He rallies the people of Port-au-Prince against their overlords, breaks them out of their shackles, and becomes a legend for it. Unfortunately, he continues on so long in the series that in Assassin's Creed Rogue, Shea McCormack actually fights and mortally wounds him. He is survived by a son and becomes part of the timeline of assassins all the way to Assassin's Creed 3 in the New World. Adewale has his place among the best and he shows that sometimes brute anger, rage, can be used to your advantage. Alright, so I'm back with another walkthrough in Fallout 76, and this week I'm talking about daily challenges and weekly challenges, taking down those big creatures. And in particular, this week I'm talking about the Grafton Monster. The Grafton Monster can be a bit pesky because this creature does not spawn too often throughout this map. So I'm going to show you two places where it always spawns and then another little tidbit of information just to help you maybe track it down. So the first place I have to recommend is the Charleston Train Yard. 
The Charleston train yard is directly north of the Rusty Pick and south of Vault 76. Upon spawning here, if you follow this path, you will find this Grafton monster every time. Now, almost directly east of the Charleston train yard, we have the Charleston Capitol building. Now, upon fast traveling, you just have to go to the dam, which is east of the building, and there is yet again another Grafton monster for you to take down. Now, if these two locations aren't enough for you, there is, of course, always the daily mission, Queen of the Hunt. This doesn't guarantee you a Grafton monster spawn, but it does guarantee you a cryptid spawn. Now, if this wasn't enough for you, there is this special event, Grafton Day. And at the end of this event, there's a Grafton monster that spawns in every time. Alright, so get tracking down those Grafton monsters already, and I hope this video helped you out. Some disappointing news coming out of Ubisoft this week. Ghost Recon Breakpoint is getting no more new updates, no more new DLC. Any new content for this game is now done. They've announced in a tweet that, you know, I think this is just time. This game's kind of run its course. There has been some DLC in the past, the most recent being Operation Motherland on November of 2021, and that's it. If you've played through that, you're done for new content with this game. There is still a player base here, but honestly, I don't think this game hit the mark like Ubisoft was hoping for at launch. There was just too many glitches and issues with the game. It was actually the reason why I stopped playing. I was so excited for this game, and it just never kind of panned out the way it was supposed to, I think. And it was very unfortunate, and I think their last kind of big swing and a miss was their Quartz NFT system they brought in. It was introduced kind of... You know, not in the best way, and honestly, the player base really kind of didn't like it overall. And I think that was kind of the last straw for this project, and they just kind of, you know, said they're going to pack up their bags here. Unfortunately, if you're a fan of this game, you got what you got. Enjoy it, but that's it for Breakpoint. The popular 2 to 10 player card game Uno was developed in 1971 by Mel Robin from Redding, Ohio in a suburb of Cincinnati. It was just for friends and family initially, but it became so popular he had 5,000 copies of the game made. He later then sold the rights to some friends for 50,000 plus royalties of 10 cents per game, who then the new owners formed international games that became part of the Mattel family in 1992. Then on May the 9th, 2006, the Xbox 360 version by Carbonated Games and Microsoft Game Studios was released as a digital download via Xbox Live Arcade. Then on August 16th, 2016, Ubisoft released their version of Uno to all the platforms. There was other DLCs like Flip, where the player uses both sides of the cards, and they also had themed DLCs like Raymond, Just Dance and Far Cry themes, just to name a few. Well, Ubisoft has just released a new DLC for Uno, Assassin's Creed Valhalla themed cards. And now for the first time in Uno, the board is part of the gameplay. Players can discard their cards wisely to travel across the board and collect precious cargoes to unlock exclusive perks. Thanks to this new resource, players can engage in card fights with opponents to slow them down or unlock longboat passive effects to discard many cards at once. Throughout their exploration, players can also encounter random events that will switch up gameplay, such as Glory Regained, where players take cargo to match the player with the highest cargo, and raids where a player steals two cargoes from the target player. The DLC also introduces the brand new Evil's Raven, which allows players to travel to the place where they want and claim the rightful rewards. Now this looks like a lot of fun and a good twist on a popular card game and definitely a bold move by Ubisoft to keep this game looking fresh. Be interesting to see what other crossovers Ubisoft may bring and also utilize a board as well.
we've got a hot topic this week assassin's creed has been around for a very long time if we had to pick one favorite assassin who would you pick me i gotta go to one of my fan favorites you could go to altair i know he's the original but it's the man with the whimsical charm the personality and the double hidden blades of Ezio. he's my favorite assassin from the assassin's creed franchise when those double blades came out what a game changing mechanic that became jumping off buildings and taking out two enemies at the same time hiding on the bench taking out your targets swapping spots and then to boost it up even further they brought in multiplayer that's a whole other subject however but my favorite assassin over three games probably deserves a remake i think Ezio Altitore. all right corey let's grab our vr to become a townsman good day this week you and i grabbed our headsets for vr to play a dude i'm gonna call it a village builder <laughs> this okay. yeah, you know fair. what i mean it is a, it's a city builder but it's really not it's more of a you're kind of building a village that's been stranded and you're off to, it depends if you want to play the story mode story more more or less kind of unveils what's going on in the world while you're stranded on this island you got to go back to king richard mm -hmm. kind of thing and from there you know revitalize everything but you're building your way along these chapters which may which is basically a tutorial right that's mm -hmm. what it, it turns out to be it gives you the stepping stones of how to play the game and it's really cool i actually do i was you know what the biggest thing for me is how impressive the game looks in yeah. vr i was really surprised you have this knight that's right in front of you and he's talking i was like I'm, dude, I was, I'm expect, inspecting him. I go, yo, you're like crisp looking. Like, mm -hmm. this is sharp. I was really, really impressed. It's a whimsical kind of, you know, goofy charm to the game that I actually appreciate. I did like that kind of sense of humor about the game. Once you're done all that, or if you just want to jump into it, there is a sandbox mode as well. But before I get to that, Corey, what were your overall thoughts of Townsman VR? Well, I can say, Drew, this is the first time I've ever played a... I'll agree with you. We'll call it a town builder. I think they officially <laughs> yeah. named it a, like a medieval city builder. Um, yeah, that's But fair. regardless, it's it's kind of the first step into this realm I've ever had in VR. And like you said, it's, it's cool. crisp. I mean, we have these kind yeah. of, you know, cartoony animations as far as the style of what they're going for, uh, for the graphics. And it does look good. The voiceovers of the characters... Like uh, Sir yep. Quunk a lot. <laughs> he comes up, <laughs> yeah. he's in the clouds. You can move the clouds out of the way. Like everything in this game is interactive and they've really kind of brought this VR element in very well into this game. Overall, yeah. my first impression of this game was I had a lot of fun. I haven't played a good city builder in a while. And this one is, you know, cartoony as it is. It is simplified in a way, but it is still, you know, there's a lot going on. You have to kind of keep track of everything that's happening you know you need wood for this so you know you're gonna build kind of a loggers camp and then you need somebody to chop those trees and then you need to turn those logs into boards and then you need someone over <laughs> at the quarry getting stones so you there's everybody's got to collect something and the nice thing is is because you're kind of this gigantic figure in the world are these two giant uh you know knight gloves as hands and you can yeah. kind of pick people up and put them where they need to be to assign them certain jobs or you can even help them out by grabbing the wood and bringing it to the location they need it to so i kind of like that element right it's that's kind of the unique ability of this city builder where you get to take a little more control than just pointing and clicking i mean i could grab that person i could throw them across the island if i wanted to or toss them in the water i mean it's yeah, it's, I that. it's funny right there's this comical kind of <laughs> yeah. under layer there the entire time and i found myself because of the way the controls are set up every time i'd get a little too close to the ground i'd be moving the hands around and i would just be hitting everybody on the ground i feel terrible <laughs> they don't do any damage to them you can move them around wherever you want just but it's just it's funny yeah. right i mean it slows things down and the biggest thing here for me was getting over the controls the controls as unique as they oh, are man are a little difficult to get used to. You're moving the camera around a lot with these controls, and we'll kind of get into your initial experience, but when I first oh, jumped in with the man. controls, it was just, 
a little difficult to kind of get my bearings. I felt like I was really whipping the camera around a lot. And as I yeah. started to play this game a little bit more, I've been able to control it a lot better. And it's a little more intuitive than I initially thought. There are some things I would like to change as far as how you move around. But for the most part, it was just more of a learning curve thing than I think it being, you know, executed wrong. No, absolutely. I think the more I played, the more I got comfortable with the controls. But initially, dude, when I started this up, I didn't last five minutes before I got motion sickness. <laughs> like it hit me hard. Mm -hmm. The way you move in the game is you grab and then you pull forward. Well, the, to turn, you grab both hands and then you pivot. As you kind of punch one forward, you turn, right? Mm -hmm. So what I did initially not realizing is I actually put my hand to the side and I was thinking I was gonna go in one direction and it didn't i went in the opposite direction yeah. and because that just messed with my brain big time dude i was out like on the couch out that <laughs> it, like, it was so bad yeah. we went back to it i'm like okay let's try this again and sure enough the more i played the more i got comfortable okay now i know when i do this i'm gonna turn this way and it didn't mess me up so much and that's when i kind of really fell in love with the game so the controls for camera angle isn't as smooth as i would like it to be the grab mechanic to pull forward is super super slow yeah because you you were literally like only moving maybe an inch at a time every time like you it. grab it dude my arm is like out here and i'm way back here and i moved like this far mm -hmm. it's like okay i'm trying to get across the screen right i wish there'd be in other games there's this teleportation system where you push up on the analog stick and then it boom, leaps you forward right or if you flick left or right on the analog stick it will pivot you here's the thing you flick left or right it pulls up all your menus yes. <laughs> this is i'm like okay i get it right it's a city builder you need some kind of menu system focus it though on one of the analog controllers not on both yeah. that's the problem they they mapped it to both if they could just map one of those controllers to have all those functions that'd be a lot easier and then i could then flick my left stick and pivot around right you can move quarterly or 90 depending on which game you're kind of playing in this instance you can't do that that's why they went with these other con controls but all in all dude i've had a really good time playing this hey, it's nice to see a city builder experience come over to the world of vr oh yeah for sure uh, <clears throat> i am so concord uh, loyal knight to uh King well Corey, i think we've had a great time playing this game it's nice to see a city builder like this experience i love the charm of the game it is as you and i just talked about a little bit pricey we're talking off camera about the price it is 55 dollars so kind of be mindful going into that price zone you better be a fan of the city building genre in order to get into this game and once you get into it if you can get past the camera controls then i think you're in for a great time but there's a couple little <laughs> hurdles just to be mindful of before you get in there all in all though dude i had a great time i'm there 7.5 what about you you know what i'm in that same realm man like we just said the price is up there it's expensive for a vr title you are getting yeah. quite a bit of content here as far as the city builders yep. concerned it's pretty involved i mean there's a lots going on sure there's lots of different buildings and different aspects of the game that you have to take into consideration and it looks amazing i think it's one of the better yeah. vr games i've played as far as how it looks graphically and i had a ton of fun playing it but just between the beginning controls when you first get into this yeah. game just kind of figuring that out and the price it brought me down a little bit from what i initially wanted to score this one i'm going to give it a seven nice A unique city builder that works very well in VR. Some issues with motion sickness and controls can hinder some players at the beginning, but overall a fun comical experience that anyone can enjoy. My favorite assassin from the AC series has got to be Eivor. I know Valhalla is the newest game in the series. It's actually the highest selling game of the series and for good reason. Origins kind of brought in this new RPG style of Assassin's Creed that we hadn't really seen before and coming into Valhalla they've somewhat perfected it into in a, in a sense some people maybe didn't love it as much but honestly when I got my hands on this game I couldn't put it down. I played through all the DLCs at this point. I'm 125 plus hours into this game and I could still jump back in for more more. 
Eivor is my favorite assassin from the AC series. I just love everything about him. You can play as a male or a female, switch it up through the entire game. There's so many things to customize about Eivor, whether it's the equipment or the mounts you ride. I mean, I'm riding bears, elk, ethereal wolves. I mean, Eivor's just so cool. I can be that stealthy assassin that uses the bow and my wrist blade and all that kind of awesome stuff, or I can run in there like a bull, double handing Dane axes and just ripping stuff up. And I think that's a, the part about Eivor that I love so much is that I can play the game however I want and this character is going to do it for me to perfection, honestly, in my mind. Eivor is definitely my favorite assassin from the AC series. We're introducing a new segment this week called Beyond the Game, where we talk to insiders who work in the video game industry to discuss how they landed a job and found their career path within the video game space. So stick around. Good friend of mine is up next, Josh Silverman. What's up, everybody? I'd like to welcome Josh Silverman, a friend of mine that I've known for a very long time within the industry that I've worked with, and he's just recently had a change of heart in somewhat of the industry and lined up something a little new and interesting. But Josh, we're here for a new segment to introduce people to the other side of video games and breaking things down. Not so much talking about the video games themselves, but more about the industry and how you came to land yourself in the video game industry itself. Josh, why don't you give us a lowdown how did you make it here <laughs> i ask myself that question every day so um like honest thing um it's been this this past march is 10 years more more or less in the industry I, i'd say yeah. that loosely but uh in my case you know i was a lifelong gamer uh really you know like most of us i mean who really isn't at this point you know it, yep. You know whether you're playing something you know more casual or the quote unquote hardcore stuff we all really at this point have uh, uh gaming has its claws in us but for me yeah i i came to it i was a fan of the mass effect series and then um what is it uh just where master three came out i uh, had an idea simultaneously as my best friend at the time and uh, she and I just end up texting each other and being like, you want to just like turn on a microphone and talk about Mass Effect 3 after we finish playing it? <laughs> like it was the same thought from both of us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's 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 the start of things. We did one episode. Um, it got a little bit of attention, way more than you'd expect from just you know, dropping a random podcast <laughs> on the internet. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so we did a second one because then the ending controversy started. And then we we're just like, you know, what? I, we just enjoyed. This is just fun to do. And yeah, we just we just progressed from from there. As you know, doing podcasts and content creation, you develop a lot of skill sets. Sure. Um, it's not just hosting. It's not just editing. It's it's the you learn marketing, you learn PR, you learn uh, various communication skills. And it turned out I really liked the comms side of things, and uh, I needed to get a job a few years <laughs> back. I started reaching out to PR companies, and I had a luck. And Stride brought me on as a. Uh, uh, I think my role was effectively an assistant uh, sure. part time just because, yeah, they didn't have a lot of roles, but uh, I was friendly enough with the, the owner. And yeah, and yeah, and, and then uh, that turned into here we are now. <laughs> uh, I got to launch, you know, Dying Light 2, the number one most wishlisted game on Steam after uh, after a year campaign and got to work on amazing indies and work on actually work on packs. And uh, and then, yeah. And, uh, as anyone who you knows now, now I, I work through Jeffrey. I'm consulting as a uh, as a community manager for Xbox. So it's been it's been a hell of a the last two years have been very. <laughs> it, it's been a lot for 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 the last two years uh, after the previous eight. Then absolutely. So it, it turns out it's just your passion brought you here. Is basically what's yep. going on, right? So you didn't go to school for it at all, did you? No, I'm a five-time college dropout, in fact. Um, <laughs> uh, no, that's not an exaggeration. I'm legitimately... Uh, wait, four, 
might be four actually. So it might be a slight exaggeration. It's either four or five. I'm, but yeah, no, I, I did college um, for game design initially. Uh, and then, uh, you know, trigger warning for parental passings and stuff like that for listeners. Uh, my mom died at the very, at the very end of, well, she started the downward turn yeah. right as college began. And uh, I tried to transfer to, I transferred to a different school to do creative writing. And then she, she passed at the end of my first semester. And then it was just, you know, depression. Life. Let's change major again. Let's change major again. Let's change school again. And yeah. I did that for a while, and then I went back for marketing many years later uh, because I was I, I'm like, well, I, I clearly have a skill set. Let's get a degree under my belt. And then I got hired for a job in my first semester, and it was like, well, well I don't have to pay for this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Kind of, kind, of, kind of thing. And I know I've, I've just been really, really fortunate. So, no, it's all uh, the shorter version is, yeah, uh, it's self-taught. Um, if I find something I'm passionate about, and this is how podcasting and video editing, all the things are working on the content creation side. Yeah. If I find something I'm passionate about, I just uh, hyper fixate on it and I just learn stuff. And I'm very fortunate that I can learn very fast. Most if it's along a certain wheelhouse, a certain path. Right. You know, what are those skill sets that you use? You think on a daily basis that it might transcend over to somebody else for advice if they're looking to get into this industry on the PR side of things? I mean, if you're trying to get in the PR, really just the comms thing in general, because that's the, the kind of fun thing. Comms, when I say this, just to, just to give listeners an idea, comms is uh, PR. So breaking that down, public relations. That's your people who send out the press releases, write the pitches. Yep. Uh, if you see an article, you know, get written on like or like an interview happened that now that might have been that media outlet reaching out to pr saying hey we'd like to interview present this but it also could have been the pr outlet being like hey we have a client who knows these topics do you want to talk about this you know a little professional than that uh sometimes i wrote that with that level of thing because uh, it was fun and i really like to change things up but yeah i know so that's the pr side then there's community management what i'm you know doing now which kind of crosses into social media management as well which is managing twitter accounts uh posting on reddit so managing a discord community that one is probably the most ingrained with content creation if, yeah. if one of your listeners is on that side of thing and then there's the influencer management which is kind of like that's really the grow the more growing field at this point because people still don't quite know what that one means uh but that's you know that's pr specifically focused on influencers those are putting together those ops that you see where a bunch of influencers get a packages and stuff like that or all the hashtag ad things um so yeah those are like you know like the four discrete fields that tend to depending on the company can cross over like i did almost all of those with pr being the leading one in my in my last job that's awesome josh thank you so much for coming on today's show absolutely what, before i do let you go i do have to ask what are you playing right now Ah, uh, the Yakuza series. Really? Uh, yeah. If anyone follows me, I'm I'm at Bear Punch on Twitter. You can see I have several threads of I, I'm now on the f well, Yakuza Four is what I'm on, which is technically the fifth game because you start with zero. Yeah. Um. And yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make like an amalgamated thread like of all of my threads, <laughs> so people if people care, I don't know. But yeah, um, yeah, I been wanting to play them for a while i've been slowly buying them on sale and then i got i was really down and depressed at the end of last year and i was like screw it time to start and the idea was it was going to take me years to get through them and nope i'm a, uh, probably tonight from our recording gonna finish yakuza 4 the fifth game and it's you know the beginning of april so uh nice. i like them a little i like them a little bit a little bit <laughs> absolutely josh again thank you so much for hanging out today that everybody is what the side of pr looks like once in a while everybody's perspective is a little bit different Alright, so if I had to pick my favorite assassin from the Assassin's Creed franchise, well it has to go to Altair. I remember way back when this came out, alongside Mass Effect, around Christmas time I picked both these titles up 
and over the holidays I played them to their fullest. I remember hopping into the world of Assassin's Creed and being blown away. The character Altair, he starts off gritty and angry and as the story progresses you really see a transition in his character. He becomes the ultimate assassin and a true leader for the guild. And ultimately, I mean, Ezio, all these other guys are awesome, but Altair really set the foundation for this franchise. Let's check in on everybody's favorite bubblegum hero. We're taking a look at Kirby and the Forgotten Land, and this is the latest release from HAL Laboratories. Not exactly an expert. I haven't played any Kirby games since Kirby Air Ride, which we're probably never gonna get again. This Kirby adventure, it all is surrounding the Waddle Dee's existence. I don't know what a Waddle Dee is. I don't know what a Kirby is. I don't know if anybody knows who these characters are, but the Waddle Dee are somewhat of a different race that live alongside Kirby and a lot of the other creatures in the Forgotten Lands. Now, some evil is afoot. There's a lot of these kind of enemies and bosses that arise to kind of crush the Waddle Dee city. Their civilization is in ruin, and it's up to you as Kirby to come in and save the day. Quite nice to look at, actually. It is not super high resolution, but this is, again, a Nintendo Switch game. This is a Kirby game. It has everything that you would come to expect. Not super texturized HD, but at the same time, there's beautiful color. You go through a forest, you go through kind of a beach, you go through a little bit of an amusement park. There's a bunch of these different biomes that kind of split up the game, so it doesn't all look quite the same. You do return to this Waddle Dee city. As you bring more of these Waddle Dees back home, they open up new businesses, new buildings, they rebuild their entire city, and that'll give you the option to level up certain abilities. Now these abilities come from different enemies that you can inhale. You consume them in what I can only imagine is a horrific way. There may be one with a boomerang. Well, you swallow them up and now you use the boomerang to attack enemies. There's a lot of these different varieties of enemies that you can use and that's part of the fun, is finding what kind of a Kirby do you enjoy. They've added something to this game that was not in any Kirby prior and that is the ability to inhale much larger objects. You don't quite inhale them and absorb their power. If anything, it's quite the opposite. You stretch around the object and you can control it, but you're kind of limited in what you can do. But what that does is it adds a lot of variety to the levels. You can go through this section. The amusement park is one that sticks out to me. You can kind of wrap yourself around one of the roller coaster rides and then you, well, you take a little ride. Absorbing different powers and stretching yourself over larger objects adds to a little bit of variety when it comes to getting through from point A to B and liberating all these Waddle Dee. You don't have a huge amount of things to do other than kind of the bread and butter. This is a platformer. The platformer is not terribly difficult. If you're a kind of a Mario veteran, you're gonna slide right through this game and not have too much difficulty. Now, there are two different settings. You can go for the more story, casual kind of play, or you can do what I did, which is not hard mode, but much more of a technical kind of aspect. Not terribly difficult, though, I have to reiterate. There are boss fights, 
that are much more varied than I would have expected. Um, again, not terribly difficult though. If you don't have an ability copied from an enemy and you find yourself in this boss fight, there are little star tokens that the boss puts out from attacking you and you can absorb those and fire it back into the boss. A lot of the time that's the easiest way of fighting the boss fights. So I'm not sure if I really enjoy that that is added or if it's really just to kind of push you along if you were having some trouble. I'm not sure of the total number of Waddle Dee. You are able to kind of just burn through the game and, and avoid all of the extra Waddle Dees, we'll say. There's not a whole lot of direction beyond that. You can kind of burn through these main levels, go from level to level, world to world, or you can kind of do a detour and visit these little secret areas that pop up along the way. They offer much more of a challenge, usually a time trial thing, but it offers just a little bit more difficulty if you are enjoying your time in the game and you want to extend it maybe a little farther. I've read online this game is about 12 hours, could be almost double that if you're going to 100% the game. There's a lot of Kirby here. This game is something that I think Kirby fans are really going to appreciate. It doesn't have kind of genre shifting super difficulty. It has the kind of calm, casual experience that I think Kirby fans are used to. I find the story to be not super important beyond save the Waddle Dee, but that checks the box. That does just as enough of a story as I need to progress through these levels. The difficulty isn't quite where I want it to be, but I'm not the expert on this series really. So I think it does fit in with all of the other releases, but I would have just liked a just a shred more difficulty. Maybe a hard, hard mode. The game is beautiful to look at. It's very colorful. There's not a whole lot going on in sound direction, but that's not very necessary in this title. Beautiful colors, a nice world to run through. I really like that amusement park area. I had a good time with this game. I think it really is um, a good, outstanding release on Switch. There's not a huge amount of those nowadays, and we don't see Kirby very often, so I'm impressed with this one. I had a great time. I think my little brother is going to love it, and I'm going to give this one an 8. Again, all that it's missing is just a little bit of difficulty and maybe some more of the surrounding world. I want to learn more. What is Kirby? What is a Waddle Dee? Kirby in the Forgotten Land is an excellent adventure in a colorful world. Good platforming action, but lacking in overall difficulty. Well, that was one heck of an episode. Beautiful side scroller, VR, and Kirby. Kirby was back. Holy, that's a show. Everybody, thank you for hanging out with us, and we'll see you next week inside the game in this world a once vibrant civilization has fallen to the forces of nature let's hit them all Ooh, a nice summer sun hey at least there's no line a snow day my favorite there's plenty to see and explore here in this world wait waddle -dees don't belong in cages set them free some big baddies will try to stop you. So